My name is Steve Coral. I'm a dentist in Boulder, Colorado, and I've been a dentist for over 30 years and a member of IAOMT for over 20. I uh, was an early converter to mercury-free dentistry back in 1983. As a matter of fact, today may very well be the 30th anniversary of the last time I placed an amalgam filling. Now, the article that uh, you see was published in a, in a magazine called Compendium of Continuing Education in Dentistry, which is a, uh, essentially a trade journal, but it has peer-reviewed articles that appear in there every, uh, every issue. So it's, uh, it verges on being a serious scholarly journal. And it goes out free to 90,000 dentists. The importance of that is that one of the big problems with dental amalgam and mercury in dentistry is a chronic information gap that affects the dentists of the world, United States and Canada. Uh, the sources of information that dentists typically have access to have not taken the mercury issue seriously. They have uniformly swept it under the rug. They've adhered to the line that, uh, oh, there's nothing wrong with it, or uh, maybe we're using it less than we used to, but scientifically there's nothing wrong with it. The whole import of the mercury-free dental movement is to point out that scientifically there's everything wrong with it. And the, uh, the scientific evidence is, uh, is voluminous and accessible, except it's not accessible in dental journals. So my main point in this article, or the first point in this article, was to, was to note that uh, most of, if not all of, the research that supports the notion that there is something scientifically wrong with mercury exposure from dental amalgam, most of that information appears outside of the dental literature. It appears in medical literature and toxicology and environmental literature, but miraculously it all becomes neutralized and, uh, and does not appear where dentists are looking. So dentists are actually uh, legitimately expressing an honest opinion when they say there's no science behind worrying about mercury in, in amalgam. Uh, I was very pleased that the uh, editors of this, uh, of this journal, the Compendium, uh, were willing to accept an article like this, and I was very pleased that they kept in certain of the, the, the key uh, pieces of information that, we, that those of us in this mercury-free movement have had access to for many years, in particular those two photographs the photograph of mercury droplets sweating out of a polished amalgam sample, and the photograph of the, uh, the, the autoradiogram of the sheep that had been subject to uh, uh, amalgam fillings that were tagged with radioactive mercury. Uh, these were some hair-raising bits of information that I saw many years ago, and I can't tell you how many times I have thought that this is it. That's the piece of information that's going to tip the world over and uh, nobody's going to trust mercury and amalgam anymore. And I've been disappointed every time because those pieces of information don't show up on the radar of the dentists. So that's the import of this particular article. It's the first article, serious scientific nature, explaining some of the key points of hazards of mercury in dental amalgam that will be seen by many dentists. The approach I took in this article uh, was to highlight the uh, risk assessment aspects of exposure. Now, um, one, of the, one of the things you always hear is uh, from people who are excusing mercury exposure from dental amalgam is not that they deny that it happens, but they say there's too little that comes out of the fillings to harm anybody. So how much is too little? Is it eeny-weeny or is it actually quantifiable? 
and it turns out it is quantifiable, and there is not a whole lot of, uh, of disagreement with the quantities of mercury that are emitted by dental amalgam. There is disagreement as to what that quantity means. The, uh, the dentists of the world have been told by the sources available to them that it might take up to 450 fillings to uh, achieve an exposure that is actually a toxic level exposure. Uh, whereas people who are more, uh, who are practicing risk assessment in a more scientific way uh, point out that the actual, the way you actually establish a toxic dose would yield um, a toxic exposure to some segment of the population at a, at a much lower rate. Estimation of 450 fillings or 450 filled surfaces to get at a toxic exposure level comes from a uh, a very rough approximation of the accepted practices of risk assessment. Um, the people who wrote the article that uh, proposed that number uh, used what's essentially a, uh, a level of mercury exposure that would cause a, a building to be evacuated in an industrial setting as their toxic level. And uh, anybody who practices risk assessment knows that you can't use the worst case scenario as your, as your cutoff level, as your regulatory exposure level. You have to factor in variations in the population, uh, variations in, in susceptibility according to age, variations in susceptibility according to genetic predisposition, uh, each of which cuts down the allowable level of exposure so that you're placing no risk on the general population. Uh, so the, and those are called uncertainty factors. Uncertainty factors are arithmetic factors that are used to, uh, to just reduce the levels of exposure uh, because of uncertainty in the data. In other words, if you have a uh, an effect level that you can you can determine on adult male industrial workers who are exposed to mercury vapor uh, you're not and they're working 40 hours a week you're not going to use that level of exposure as a safety uh, as a, uh, a safety factor for a six-year-old who might be exposed to mercury from fillings 168 hours a week. Uh, first of all, the child is much more susceptible to the effects, much lower body weight, so there's much, much more exposure per organ. And uh, you, have to, you have to cut down from that, uh, that industrial panic button la layer to get a, a, a more realistic level of exposure that you can allow in a child. So, as opposed to 450 filled surfaces, our friend uh, Dr. Mark Richardson, for example, had a very detailed risk assessment that said that uh, at an acceptable exposure to mercury vapor for a young child, that child might achieve that level of exposure with only one or two surfaces of filling. My position would be in this modern age, in the 21st century, when you can use uh, materials such as dental composite, which are uh, known to be thousands of times less toxic than mercury, don't use the mercury, use the composite.